I'd like to welcome everyone to the 969th monthly meeting of AtMob on uh, today, December 14th, 2023. Our guest speaker will be Glenn Chappell, and he will talk about astronomy with small telescopes. So I, I hope everyone had a enjoyable Thanksgiving, meeting friends and family, and everyone's looking forward to the upcoming holidays. Oh. <laughs> so, 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 public service announcement, of course. Um, 3 a.m. after it's been sitting out there you, all night. You know it gets cold out there at night, right? Don't, don't. You'll freeze right to your telescope if you're not careful. So be really careful. Shoot your eye out. You'll shoot your eye out and don't do that. Um, so I'm Rich Nugent. This is Glenn Chapel. This is the Observer's Report. And so I, I managed to steal that shamelessly from the internet. Um, but I enjoy that tonight. So um, that's our goofy picture of the of the month. Um, I love it. I, I love it. Go ahead, Glenn, you can read your quote. Well, I think you can all read it from even the back, but I'll, uh, looking at the stars suddenly dwarf my own trouble, troubles and all the gravities of terrestrial life, I thought their unfathomable distance and the slow, inevitable drift of their movements out of the unknown past into the unknown future. And that was by H.G. Wells, the author of a lot of science fiction books, including one of my favorites, War of the Worlds. Okay, we'll go from there. All right, so here's the clubhouse duty schedule for the coming months. And you, I'm not going to read them for you. You can see for yourself. Um, you know, as Steve said, it's weather permitting. If it's, if it's a miserable day and uh, no one's going to be up there, we've asked the, the folks on duty to shoot out an email just to make sure everybody's clear in the fact that the place will be closed. <coughs> um, as Steve said, sometimes during the week, people go up there. Um, if there are any A members with keys, um, then the, the clubhouse will not be open and the bathroom won't be available. But um, um, we, we were, for example, Steve put out an email yesterday. We were up there, a few of us saw lots of Gemini meteors last night. We saw some a beautiful view of the red spot on Jupiter, the shadow transit of Io. Um, it was a it was a lovely evening, despite a few snow squalls. It was not such a bad night. Um, so please come up and join us. I mean, I know it's a bit of a drive for some, but. You know, we try to do these weekends uh, around the dark of the moon, last quarter, and new moon. Um, and so come on up and, and check it out. If you're, if you're not familiar with the place, it's a great opportunity to, to hang out with us. It's, it's warm in the clubhouse. You almost have to take your coat off. It's so hot in the clubhouse now. Um, we, we, we may have to turn that back a bit when we start paying for electricity, of course, but <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Okay, next slide, next slide. So here's a planet roundup. You know, I like to, like to get you guys out there. Venus is shining at magnitude minus 4.1. Uh, it's come a long way since um, inferior conjunction. It's only 16 arc seconds uh, in diameter, 72% illuminated, but at that magnitude, it's still a great daytime object. So I encourage you, all, as always, to get out there in the daytime and see if you can hunt that down and find it. It's still 40 degrees away from the sun. Yeah. So there's really no issue about you know, worrying about getting you know, too close to the sun. If you want to play that game, come with me as we approach superior conjunction, and, and we'll, we'll see how close to the sun we can actually get. Um, I'm going to try and break my personal record, but you don't want to do that on your own. Just come with me. Um, Saturn's well-placed at sunset. Ring tilts about 9 degrees. It's going to close out next year. By mid-year, Saturn's rings will only be a couple of degrees tilted towards, our, uh, towards the Earth. And so we'll, we'll see them as obviously as like razor little appendages uh, sticking out from the side of the planet. Neptune is still out there. And Uranus is 14 degrees east of Jupiter. And Jupiter is currently shining at minus magnitude 2.7, transiting about 830, 60 degrees in the sky. And I know, this, I put this on here for Mario, I've just said before long, <laughs> on the full moon in uh, December, on the 27th, will, the moon is running very high at its full phases. And so it, it's actually about, uh, about five degrees above the ecliptic. And so on the night of the 27th, uh, it'll be almost 75 degrees above uh, the horizon at local midnight. So. You'll hear about it on the weather, and you can tell your friends all about it, too. <laughs> so those are the planets for the month. But there are some other cool things to look at this month that I wanted to make you all aware of. So the next slide, please. Of course, we saw plenty of Geminids last night. Um, but if you go home tonight, it's, it's clear out. You can still look up and see the Geminid meteors. They radiate out of the sky near Castor. And like I said last night, we weren't specifically looking for meteors. But just being out for a few hours, I, I saw about a dozen. Um, it was fun. We, we saw a lot of meteors last night. It was actually pretty good. So that's still ongoing. Um, the shower drops off, the peak drops off pretty fast. But tonight, tomorrow night, you'll still see Geminids. Um, it's up all night, so you don't have to you know, get out there 2 in the morning or just before dawn to see them. It's a kind of a fun um, meteor shower, presumably uh, debris from asteroid 3200 Phaethon. Although there's still, if you look at spaceweather.com a couple of days ago, there's 
they reported on a paper that um, debates whether or not Bacon is actually the, uh, the progenitor object and stuff. But well, who cares where they come from at this point? Just go out there and enjoy them. The next thing they get ready for is a double. Uh, oh, wait, don't make it back to Doug Pollock. Go next, next slide. Doug, are you here? I need yeah. to see Doug tonight. Doug, tell us about this yeah, picture. Nice shot. Lucky accident. Shot. I was uh, shot. shooting the, um, the greenish object to the left and. Uh, um, and this appeared. Nice. Yeah, you know, just dumb luck. Yeah. There you go. That's right. It happens, right? At, at this point, well, I've been setting out uh, an asteroid camera, a little camera in the window, uh, run it all night, and then check it the next day. Uh, I partially checked last night, didn't get anything. It's running right now. Nice. However, I seem to be getting better meteors by them. Similarly, uh, yeah, <laughs> through my so This is a nice object to look at. We were just looking at this last night. It's a double lobed planetary, 73, 12, and 13. Um, and uh, it, it's a really pretty object. Next time you're up at the clubhouse, ask for you. NGC? Yep. Did I get the number right? 27, 27? Now I got it right now. 73, 12, and 13. 73, 12, and 13? That doesn't make sense. Now it's 27. That's what you said. So, yeah, I can't remember the numbers. <laughs> it's a double world planetary in general. It's 2171 2. Okay. I can't hunt. I can barely remember my last I can barely remember my phone number. <laughs> anyway, that's a nice shot, Doug. Thank yeah, you. I have, uh, uh, I'm most of the way to having an image for it. I can post it on the website. Sure. If people want. That's pretty. I love that green color. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice. All right. Next slide. So, uh, on, the, um, on Saturday, the 30th of December, there's a nice double shadow trend. Uh, shadow transit on Jupiter um, uh, in the early evening would be very well placed for observing and uh, you can see it with almost any size telescope. Um, Ganymede casts a really big shadow. Europa's shadow is pretty tiny, um, but you still can see it. Um, they, they're just amazing. We, we were looking at Io's shadow last night and it, it's just this jet black, like a common hit pin on, on the disk of Jupiter. Really kind of pretty. And then um, the last slide I have for you um, gets me back to um, daytime observing. Remember, I've been telling you guys, folks, for months and months and months, get out there and practice daytime observing. There's a nice opportunity to watch Antares being occulted by the moon. It, it happens on Monday, January 8th, but it's, it, it happens just before 9 o'clock in the morning, um, which means the sun will be up. Now, that shouldn't stop you. Right? The moon is pretty easy to find in the sky, even in the day, right? And if you can, <laughs> usually. And if you can find the moon, I know it's a little crescent, but if you can find the moon, then you should have absolutely no trouble seeing Antares uh, in the daylight. So that nice orange supergiant star uh, on the blue background um, will be a nice um, occultation to watch. Now, Antares is a really big star, right? It's a really big star. And it actually subtends an angle of about 41 milli arc seconds right. on the sky um, because it's a big star. And so this won't be an instantaneous out. This will be a little, if you pay attention, It'll, it'll gradually dim out over about a tenth of a second. Uh, most of the time, on quotations, the star just winks out. If you blink, you miss it. Well, this one here will actually take a moment to be covered by the moon because it has a physical dimension to it um, that we can perceive from the Earth. So that's coming up in, in January. I'll send them an email to remind you. Can we leave that um, up for just a second? Yes, go ahead. We had an occultation of, Be uh, of Betelgeuse by an asteroid. We went through, the path went through southern Florida and on into Europe. And there was another one. These are rare. We even have an occultation by an asteroid of a naked eye star, especially first magnitude. That's even rarer than a solar eclipse. And there was one a number of years ago that was supposed to go right up the East Coast. It was supposed to be Regulus. And I wanted to see, just to see the, the sickle of Leo Lyon, I was say without that star there, just disappear. Well, the whole East Coast was clouded that time. And I don't know if there was any reports of anybody seeing this from Florida. The interesting, what brought it to mind was the size of Antares. Um, where Betelgeuse is a large star as well, that asteroid not, might not have totally eclipsed it. It might have been like a, one of those annual solar eclipses. So instead of the star disappearing, it might have just faded and then returned to normal. Does anybody here heard any reports of that at all? I don't know if there's anything out on the internet about it. There, there was something on spaceweather.com uh, the other morning, um, and it showed, a, it showed the light curve, and it showed a video from Italy um, where the star didn't, Betelgeuse didn't quite go out completely. But you can definitely see it drop in brightness and, okay. and come back up again. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I think that's the that's the planet roundup for the month. But I think the next thing are our observers challenges. Oh wait, no, the double star and the variable star of the month. Ah. Oh, let's not forget our friends at the stars. <laughs> hey, this month's stars are Laporis. Our Laporis is a Cardan sign. And I don't know if you've ever looked at Cardan stars. 
but they are exquisitely red stars. Um, they're very cool, so they are red to start with, and they have dredged up carbon molecules from within, and those carbon molecules are good at absorbing what little blue light there is and scattering what little blue light is being uh, emitted by the star. So it's got about a 430-day period. It's pretty close to the minimum right now, which puts its magnitude down here, you know, down here, 10th magnitude, 10th and a half, maybe even 11th, which makes it hard to find, but it'll be well worth the trip, well worth the work trying to find that star because it is so red. It's been described as a like a like a, a taillight of a car, a distant car on the black background of the sky. It's a beautiful, beautiful carbon star. It's my favorite star. Um, and so I wanted to make you aware of that. And the next slide is the variable, is the double star of the month, which I picked Kia, oh, yeah. which is Omicron 2 Eridani. Now we were looking at this at the clubhouse last night. It's a triple star system. Um, here's Orion, here's Eridanus. It's pretty easy to find this guy. It's a pretty bright star. And it's actually a triple star system where you've got the A component is a, a, a K type star, a main sequence K star. B component is a white dwarf. If you've never seen a white dwarf star before, this is a great opportunity to do it. It's, it's, what, it's the easiest white dwarf star to see in the sky. Um, and that little C companion is a little M4.5 main sequence red dwarf star. So and that's a little hard to see because it's faint, it's like 11th magnitude. But if you've got enough aperture, you can, act, you can actually make those out. They're pretty cool. My, the reason I like to go there is this guy here, right there. That B star. You don't get to see many white dwarfs. Uh, Van Manen star in Pisces is one very isolated, very hard to see. And um, my, my all-time favorite, our diabolical uh, white dwarf, is a Sirius B, oh, yeah. the, the, uh, the companion to Sirius. Uh, has anybody ever seen that from this from up here from this latitude? It's, it's challenging. A few people have. It, it, it takes... I've never seen it. I've tried and tried and tried and tried, and I haven't seen it yet. But that's why we keep going out there. What's that, Christine? Stick it off the edge of the field of view. Stick it off the edge of the field of view. I've tried occulting bars. I've tried filters. I've tried all kinds of different things. Um, anyway. But I'll wait and jump again. I'm into so Go ahead. Well, this is your part of this report, too. You can just well, jump in any time you want. This is a, kind of a preview of my talk. I've seen, again, I've seen this one with a three-inch reflecting telescope, which is, again, part of my talk today. But they're very widely separated. That's why it's not like Sirius, where you want eight arc seconds. I forget what the distance is, but it's in the order of several dozen arc second, so it's very easy to see. So that's, if you want to see a white dwarf star, go to this star and then you'll see that little point of light right near it with a small telescope. See the A and B are, they're 83, 84 arc seconds across. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that's wide. So that's really wide. Yes, sir. To, to go back to the asteroid occultation, if a star is so big that the asteroid doesn't cover the whole thing, how do you tell an annular from a partial? Well, that would be a good question. I don't know. Hmm. It might be very hard to. It, it might be very question. difficult to tell them. Yeah, probably need a strip of observers. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, no yeah. one blacks out. Yeah. yeah, even on center line, it didn't quite black out. Yeah, it wasn't visible from up here. That's why I didn't even mention it really. All right, yeah. next slide. Next slide. So these are some observer oh, challenges. Okay. You go ahead and do the. You do this part. Uh, the object for this month, and I just want to preface things, I didn't see IC10, which is last month's one, and whenever I see IC, I figure, I can't see, at least with small <laughs> telescopes. And so I didn't even, I'll be honest, I didn't even try for the Sol Nebula, I said, there's just no way. So I wrote about it, just out of, because I have to, kind of, but uh, then I looked at a little research, and Sue French has seen it with a small aperture telescope. So I think the key here is you want to go with a, a Richfield telescope. You get as wide a field of view as you can. Look at right here. This is, again, look at the size of it just compared to the constellation of uh, Cassiopeia. It's big. It's seventh magnitude, but you're talking about about a degree and a half by a degree in size. So I went out and I just didn't get a chance. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my astro scan and try that with a, uh, enough of an eyepiece to get about a two degree field of view and see how well I do. But that's a story with that one. It was really tough. But we have some pictures here. John Bishop was at the clubhouse last night. He was using his binoculars and he said that, and, and he, uh, see how long do you think he was sitting there with a, like an hour? Quite a while. Um, quite a while until he, he could actually see a little bit of it with his binoculars. But then he tried it with his telescope. He said he couldn't see it in the telescope. No. I imagine large ed exit pupil cut with a filter yeah. And then a wide enough field of view. Which yeah. but, but look at what some of the images field. can do. Go ahead. Either that or button slot for his night vision. Yeah. Because you I've seen it with, I, I, I've seen it with that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's so huge. So. 
Okay, we'll go to the next slide. And we'll let the people, Doug Paul took an image. We'll each person explain their image. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, well, that's uh, what, uh, three hours of, uh, of data with a, a 600 millimeter lens. That's almost full, full field of view. Yeah. It's, uh, as, uh, as you already said, it's, uh, it's gigantic. Uh, that, that was also, this, the camera was the Canon RA, which has extended red response. Oh, by the way, I see uh, 1848 is actually the name of one of the clusters inside. There are several clusters immersed, but they're relatively uh, obscure. But that's how this particular object got its name. Okay. Chris? Yes, I, these, these are not from the middleman this time. I have some data from the middleman, but I haven't had time to process it yet. And that's a huge mosaic. I'll get to that at some point, but not not anytime soon. This is from my driveway in Arlington. Mm, uh, wow. So this this <laughs> is um, yeah. So this is with a uh, 150 millimeter f 2.8 telescope. So this is uh, so this is a narrow band data for luminance. Uh, I, I did sulfur two, hydrogen alpha, and oxygen three, and combined them as a luminance channel. So it's half hour. It's a half hour total of of narrow band. And then a quarter hour of RGB data. Uh, so you don't need much time to get this if you have a really fast scope. And by the way, I believe that that is the cluster there itself, mm -hmm. IC1848. Yeah. I love these pillars here. I love mm -hmm. this. It's beautiful. Look at that. Yeah, Look at these. yeah there's a smart <laughs> number of areas that are worth exploring. On yeah, as Mario is going to show us in a minute. <laughs> and this is this is what I used for the luminance in the previous one. This is the SHO color version using yeah. just a narrow band for half an hour, half an hour total. Fabulous. Nice. Okay, Mario. This was taken with the hyperstar attached to my C8. Uh, so that gives me a three by two and a half field of view. And I took this with one shot color and a Hutech uh, filter that uh, multi narrow band. Uh, that gives nice. Uh, and what did you nickname it? You had your own. Well, I think it, to me, as a physician, that looks like an ultrasound of a fetus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> no question. But anyways, look definitely the, more than the soul. Look at the area yeah. of, of the mouth, the chin, and the area of the yeah. forehead, uh, because the next two photos are zoomed in on those. But I could have okay, that one. Yeah, uh, that's the the chin right there. That, that cleft the chin from the rest of the body and just look at those mountain like look, uh, areas and there's all this activity mm. and uh dark nebula with stars buried in the uh, uh dark nebula on the left which would be the chin just a fascinating area this is the this is the one i was talking about mario right here i love that one big oh yeah well that's a probably a dark uh black blood. yeah yeah but all, all that is radiating away from those hot stars. The, uh, the, this is the forehead area. It looks just like a dark band on the wide field. But when you zoom in with the 32 inch, it separates into this really interesting complex of, uh, uh, of uh, dark nebula. that's I think probably eroding away from the hot stars near it. Mm -hmm. There's that other area in the southern part I started taking a picture, but then it clouded over. But uh, we'll probably go back to it next year. It's, it's worth zooming into all these areas. It's just fascinating real estate. Definitely. Goes. <clears throat> okay, the uh, object for next uh, for January. And this one's a little easier. I did check this out just a couple nights ago. Uh, NGC 936. It's a lenticular barred spot barred galaxy in the constellation Cetus. And it's not far actually from Myra. We're just talking about that. And I did go out with a 10 inch telescope to take a look. And I was pleasantly, after these strikeouts of a couple of ICs, uh, this was easy. It was very bright. In fact, I think you could see it with a smaller telescope. I didn't get a chance to try it with a four inch, but I think this is a small telescope object as well. And here's uh, Doug Paul's image. And it has a nickname, the Darth Vader uh, Nebula, because this is the main nucleus, and then there are a couple of knots in the bars right there, and it does look like a TIE fighter. So this is one definitely, if you're a visual observer, check this one out, it should be no trouble at all. And I am going to try to get with a smaller telescope. I, I saw it just two nights ago, and uh, again, nice object, should be a good one. We were looking at that at the clubhouse last night also, um, really, really nice, nice little galaxy, surprisingly nice. Were you able to see the bars as well? Or? 
or the cl clouds were actually yeah. we, we were we were plagued by clouds at that very moment. Mm -hmm. We didn't stay long on it, but mm -hmm. right. it was be worth a close look at brightness. It was pretty easy. Yeah, it was pretty easy. We we were pop I popped over to M77 and we looked at 1055 NGC 1055. And then we popped over to 936. So. What, what's that thing on over to the left? There right are here? Two, yeah. There are two more galaxies. Yeah, there are. Yeah. There are a couple of galaxies in the area. This, by the way, you want to use high magnification once you found it. It's only about four arc minutes across. In fact, uh, when Herschel discovered it, he categorized it as a planetary nebula rather than as a nebula or a faint nebula or whatever. He thought it was a planetary. There, like the Saturn nebula. The center is pretty bright, but there is a very dim yeah. surround. And my the image that will be presented at the next meeting has about seven hours of, of data in it. Yeah. If you want a real challenge, see if you can spot those other two galaxies. When the one up in the upper right, it looks fairly, with a pretty good surface. Yeah, right like there, yeah. It's been cropped so that there's another one farther to the left. Yeah. I, These little faint guys might be tough. Is that, is that a galaxy up there? It, looks, it doesn't look stellar. At the left edge is another galaxy. Yeah, yeah right, right there. there. And that, that's another There's one more. Yeah. Uh, there's one more. Uh, Again, it's been cropped yeah. out. Yep. Yeah, Doug, I cropped it so we get this a little bit larger. That's why it was cropped out. My apologies. So that's the January object, if you're so inclined. Um, it gives you a good reason to go out and observe, right? A cold winter night, right? What, you need, sometimes you need a reason to go out and observe. So to get involved with you know, Roger and Sue's uh, challenge of the month, and just go out and see what you can do. I mean, even negative observations. I know Glenn doesn't like to write it up if he hasn't seen it, but sometimes that's just as valuable as a legit observation. If, you know, my skies are in Framingham are terrible, and I guess what, I can't see this object. Well, maybe that's going to help somebody down the line a little bit. So, uh, Roger's article, that, that Observer's Challenge is read by thousands of people every month, all over the world. So, he does a pretty good job with that. And I, I think the last slide for us is um, the, just my summary of the, of the objects. The um, IC1848, uh, um, the, the cluster gets three stars from Keppel and Saturn, one star for the nebulosity. The galaxy gets three stars, so it's a fairly bright object, 10 magnitude, 10.2, um, with a surface brightness of 13.5. To me, that would seem like it would be challenging, but that was actually a pretty bright galaxy we looked at yeah. last night, so that's good. And I think that's it for the observer's report. It should be. So with that, I think we'll move on to our guest speaker, which will be our own Glenn Chapel. Uh, he'll be talking about uh, small telescope observing. You, know, you can see a surprising amount of solar system and deep sky sites. Glenn Chapel will describe half a century of cosmic adventures with his small telescopes, in particular his 3-inch F10 Edmund Scientific Space Conqueror Reflector. Many of us know Glenn Chapel, but for the benefit of our newer members, Glenn is a highly accomplished amateur astronomer, writer, and former president of ATMOB. He started observing during high school in 1963, went on to work at the Alice G. Wallace Planetarium in Fitchburg in 1968, and then from 1974 to 2007, Glenn taught middle school science at Fitchburg and then Groton Dunstable. All the while, he was writing numerous books, chapters, and articles for many publications, such as the Observing Basics column in Astronomy Magazine. That goes all over. Glenn's been a member of ATMOB since 1980, and he has contributed over 80,000 variable star observations to the AABSO. In 2022, the mi minor planet 1984 SF3 was renamed 11831 Chapel in honor of his contributions to amateur astronomy. So please welcome Glenn. Thank you. Left and right, look and see if the big side is high. Vance, and we have a pointer. You know what? I'll just walk out there. That's fine. That's a pen. Here, Glenn. You want to point for a minute? It's a pen. I'll just draw it. Here, Glenn. Okay. Glenn. You have a pointer. My goodness. I always have one. This reminds me of one of my ex fishing rods. Okay. Yeah, is there a light that I can read my notes by? Like, you know what? There's enough. I think here, this this will keep the light on. That's oh, not. Oh, that's okay. No, you know what? Let's just see. We have enough here. That's okay. All right. Well, good evening. I gave this talk actually a number of years ago, but it bears the repeating sometimes. I'm a visual observer, and my lifetime has been with small aperture telescopes. I used to write a column for Deep Sky Monthly on Double Skies, and that I worked with a three-inch telescope. But let's go, let's go to the first slide. 
Is that correct? You might run inside. Sure. Then I don't have to. I can't chew gum and walk at the same time. <laughs> All right, what is a small telescope? And here are five examples, and I have one of each of those. Over here is a Tasco Classic Refractor. Rich Nugent is well familiar with that because he just took the one that I bought and kind of tuned it up for me a little bit. There's a Space Conqueror and uh, an Astro Scan. And a funny story, the Space Conqueror, they advertised the thing. I think they said it could split double stars down to about three arc seconds, and you could see stars to magnitude 10.5. Well, after I'd used this telescope for a while, I wrote them a nasty letter, claiming them being false advertisements. So you said it could only you could split double stars down to three arc seconds. I've split them down to 1.8 arc seconds. You said 10.5 magnitude. I've seen 12th magnitude stars. Well, they rewarded me by sending me a free astro scan, so that's how I got that scope. <laughs> and this is one of the first telescopes I ever used. The Gilbert 80 power telescope. And this is the telescope that got, actually got me into astronomy. And then finally, uh, the SkyQuest, four and a half inch SkyQuest from Orion telescopes. I have all of those, and I still, this one I don't use so much. It's just there just for old time's sake. But the others I do use rather frequently. Okay, we'll go on the next slide. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say small aperture telescopes are nice and cheap. <laughs> what are you going for now? About three thousand dollars? Seven? I don't think the numbers are in the thousands. It's a three and a half inch telescope, and I'm not quibbling here. On certain nights of the year, this scope is not going to perform. It's going to outperform anything. But on the average night, you won't do that much better than you would with a standard three inch telescope. So, but it is nice if you have the money for that. It's a nice thing to have on the mantle there, and it's very portable. Take it outside. But that's one of the things I like about small aperture telescopes. Outside of things like the Quest Tab, they're relatively inexpensive. They're portable, and for some of us people are getting up there in years, they're easy to move around and handle. But, we'll go to the next slide. Well, here's my scope, and I was going to bring it in, but I had this float tube that I was going to get fixed too. I couldn't take them both. But a little story, that's what the scope looked like when I first bought it, and then I souped it up. Uh, Edmund went into selling telescopes with a red cover, so I just kind of souped up the telescope. It's kind of like taking a classic 1958 Cadillac and cutting off the fins to maybe look more modern. <laughs> but the skull, I still use this. I just used it a couple of nights ago, and it still works very nicely. I bought my original for $15 from a friend. That's what it cost. And this is a telescope that's carried me through a lifetime of observing. So it's, it's, it's like I say, I still use this telescope now, and it does very well. We'll talk about that. I'm going to talk about small telescopes in general, but I'm going to refer to this a bunch of times during this talk. Glenn? Yes? Is your guide scope upside down when you refurbished it? Yeah, it is. I just didn't know. <laughs> He's just looking at the ground. Oh, I know what you're looking at. <laughs> That's another scope in the back. That's the main oh, one they okay. had. Good, good thing you noticed that. I hadn't thought of that before. <laughs> I should have told you yes, just so you could diminish my credibility here. <laughs> but that's what it looked like originally. That's what the original, that guide scope is on the other side. And that's actually, that it was an eight power telescope that you could be a little kit they could make. And I liked it so much, I just mounted on the main telescope. And in fact, the first asteroid I ever saw, Vesta, I viewed with this telescope, not with the main scope. So that even had some use. Next slide. Well, I turned to the dark side. It was around 1980 that Colter started selling a 13-inch reflecting telescope for $350. I jumped at that. I wasn't going to take any chances on that. And it was my, it has been my main telescope for variable stars for a number of years. I recently sold it to Bruce Berger, who's going to take the optics out and refurbish a little bit. Um, but there was a problem with this telescope when it came to traveling any place. Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't work. But I had the astro skin. Next slide. And that fit in the car, and that worked very nicely. And I do use this for some serious astronomy. Uh, we'll go on to the next slide. And I'm just kind of going, I have my notes up there, but I'm going to try to go without them. <laughs> this is a photograph, an image I took. This is the sky course, the four and a half inch scope with my a cell phone right here. And at the last star party, the one was in, what town was that in, Rich? Uh, Stowe. Stowe, Massachusetts. I brought that <coughs> scope and the little cell phone. We had a bunch of Atmob people there, so people were looking through the telescope. So I invited people to come over just to take their cell phones and take an image. And I have a 16 millimeter uh, Nagler eyepiece. It works fine. It's got a nice wide field, so the object stays there for a long time. There's enough magnification. And people were having success taking uh, their cell phone images on the moon. That's all I did, just sat there and let people take their images. 
And I've been doing that at a number of star parties. I'll just set this aside and just say, come on over, take a break, and just try to take an image. And it's a souvenir. They get to take this home with them. They can share them with their friends. So it's kind of a fun aspect. I try at a number of star parties to bring a small aperture telescope because most of the scopes that we bring are very large instruments. And John Q. Public might walk away thinking, this is nice, but I can't, I can't afford a big, huge telescope to see Saturn's rings. So I try to bring that little telescope, show them Saturn's rings, show them a couple of things, the Andromeda galaxy, whatever, so you can see these things with a small telescope. You don't need to spend a gazillion dollars. And that's the message I try to bring uh, when I go to a star party. Uh, just a couple of images I took of the moon, and by the way, Sal said another thing. You've been imaging with, what, a six-inch telescope, right. and he's making it to me. I know Paul is a small instrument as well. I'm That's not talking about astro imaging because it's not something I do, but that might be a future topic if somebody come up and talk about what you can do with a small aperture instrument when it comes to astro imaging. But on this particular night, I hit pay dirt. I wasn't planning on anything, but I got the Lunar X and the Lunar V. And uh, i got to step back. The Lunar V is up there. That's a blow-up of that. The Lunar X down there. And that was imaged again with that four and a half inch telescope and it's just an ordinary cell phone. Just a quick picture. Um, go on the next slide. So, Mario, you can, you can open your eyes now. We're all set. That's it. That's it with the moon. Uh, the solar system, the sun. And small, t I can't imagine, I don't know what would happen, Mario, if you took that 32 inch telescope and turned it on the sun. It would probably burn up half a Gloucester. But you don't need a large uh, telescope. In fact, you look at the uh, the coronal the differential also. heating will probably crack, crack the glass. What's that? The differential heating will yeah. probably crack the glass. Not a good thing to do with a large scope. But you know what? A twenty, a sixty millimeter refractor is probably ideal for solar observing. And you can do two ways: you can project the image, or you can put an aperture filter. Now they also used to come the cheap ones back, and would come with a little su a sun filter. Mm -hmm. And I used it. I used to use it at star parties. I had no clue. But this is what happens if you uh, don't put a solar filter on. Go to the next slide. <laughs> this was somebody trying to beat Rich Nugent's record for seeing Venus as close to the sun as you can get. It didn't work out too careful. well. You got to be careful. But at least you got a nice image and a nice projection of the sunspots. <laughs> Just for newbies, mention why the solar filters of old are not good. Yeah, good point. So if they have a screw in sun filter and they will crack because all that solar energy is being focused right on that one part of your eyepiece. And uh, that those things, and I did write an article about it for Astronomy Magazine because I'd heard about this, and I thought, is this really true? Is it a, a urban myth? So I put it in the magazine and said, would you please let me know if you've had, and I got more emails than I had in a long time about this. One person just had suffered from permanent eye damage because mm -hmm. their, their filter cracked. So throw them away if you see one around. Don't use them at all. Strictly, either project, we'll go back and go back a side. Oopsie daisy. There we go. Strictly project or by an aperture filter like that. There is also a Herschel wedge, but that starts to get a little more complicated. These are the kind of simple ways. Next slide. And the next. Now, these are, this was back in the days when I used the see-through filter there. I didn't know any better. But you can see sunspots. You can project sunspots. And in this case, just a couple of days, you can see the rotation of the sun over this is a three-day period. I had, luckily, three sunny days in a row. Yes? Is that orange peel actually the texture of the paper that you're projecting on? I probably is. Okay, probably I'm paper. curious. <laughs> yeah. In fact, these are actual sketches. So oh. this is the paper that I sketched them on. Does it look like an image? Well, thank you. <laughs> I am a sketcher. I tend to like to sketch things I see through the telescope. Next slide. And a lot of these are from slides I made probably the last time I gave a talk here. Talking about solar eclipses, I went to the one up in Canada, Prince Edward Island, back in 1972. And again, those are the images of partial phases and then the actual totality. And this is, of course, get rid of the filter. You want to look at just straight through at this particular time. And it was exciting to see prominences and so forth. But this is with a 60 millimeter refractor. And again, the screw in soul filter. I, I use that thing for about five years, never knowing. And it's one thing if it's just me, and you know, maybe five minutes I make a quick sketch, but to have kids line up, I, when I worked at the Alex G. Wallace Planetarium, I'd have a group of kids come. There'd be 60 kids looking through that telescope, and I'm thinking, now that's like playing, playing Russian roulette. Luckily, nothing ever happened. But if you have an old telescope with that solar filter, toss it. Next slide. Just the filter. Oh, yeah, just the filter, not the telescope. <laughs> okay, next slide. 
Now we're going to look at the planets, and I have with that little three-inch Edmontine every planet in the solar system, and that's why I was so thrilled when Pluto got demoted, <laughs> because I always had to say except for, now I've seen them all. And the first one is Pluto, or yeah, well, the last one, uh, first one is Mercury, and that's about what it looks like with a small telescope and about 120 power. You don't see much detail, but you can say you've seen that particular planet. And this was always a tough one for me in the past because I didn't have a good horizon. And it wasn't until I moved to near, it had a nice open field to the east, and I was able to see that planet for the first time. That's a little half moon when it was near uh, its farthest elongation from the sun. I've also put in some satellite images just for comparison. So obviously, you can't see the detail I saw there. Next slide. And if you're a newbie to astronomy, one of the neatest first projects you might want to do is to look at the phases of Venus. And I did this. These were all made back in 1970 to 1971. You can see the same things that Galileo saw with his telescope. Not much other detail, obviously. And uh, we'll go, but again, you can see the phases, which is kind of neat. Next slide. Hmm. Now this one, I, I put this in the astronomy magazine, actually, this particular sketch. Uh, and that was made with a four and a half inch, that, that uh, uh, Orion telescope, the Orion SkyQuest. And when we had that nice, op the, uh, nice opposition of Mars back in 2003, I made my observations with that telescope. And this is one sketch that I made. It's a little grainy, I think, from here, because it's being blown up. But I compared it with a Hubble image around the same time. And you got the Sirtis Major. You got this, I think it's called the Situs Meridiani. I can't name the exact name, but that's, it's kind of a neat feature as well. This area up in here, these look like pixels. Is the hellish space, and then of course the south polar cap at the top. So you can see a fair amount of detail when Mars is in a decent op uh, opposition. Again, this is with a four inch telescope. I did see the polar cap in the Sirtis Major with a 60 millimeter refractor back when there was one in 1971. So you can see some detail on Mars, even with a small, you're not going to see Olympus Mons, but at least you'll see some of the major features on Mars. Sirtis Major is probably the easiest of the dark objects or dark things to see. It's kind of a triangular thing on Mars. Now, here was a once-in-a-lifetime event, and we didn't get clouds. Um, Mars occulted the star Epsilon Geminorum. This is back, uh, do I have my notes up there? This is right out of my notebook. Uh, 7 April, you notice how yellow that is? That's how how old I've gotten over the years. 76, that was what, 50 years ago approximately? My paper's all yellowed. But anyway, on that particular night, Mars did in fact pass in front of Epsilon Geminorum. It was a neat thing to see. And I saw it with two telescopes. I used a four and a half inch reflector and my little Edmund scope, the three inch. And it was really neat to see that the two coming together. And it's like an occultation of the moon. The last minute kind of looks like the moon is still and the object is crashing into it. And I just remember Mars getting closer and closer and closer. And I actually used a four and a half inch at that particular point. Instead of it blinking out, it just kind of faded as it goes through the layers of the Martian atmosphere. Hmm. And on the other end of the scale, we have an occultation of the, by the moon. Sometimes the star blinks in before you even see it, because you don't know exactly where it's going to pop into sight. But with Mars, you had a little bit of time. And it looked like an atomic bomb explosion on the surface of Mars. You see this little whitish area, and then it grows, and it grows, and then the star reappeared. That was an amazing event. And the thing about that was I started making my observations a week ahead of that, Around April 1st, I just made a naked eye sketch of Gemini with Mars in that particular star. And each night, I'd add where Mars was. And for, straight, for seven straight nights, we had clear sky. In fact, after six nights, I said, this is just too much. We're going to lose it. And we still had it that particular day. So that was a great event. Once in a lifetime thing. Next slide. Moving on to Jupiter. This again was my very first uh, thing to look at with a, with a t small telescope. I had a little tabletop scope before I bought the Edmund. It was one of those cheap little refractors, probably a 40 millimeter refractor, probably cost about $10. It was terrible, but I could still actually look out a window uh, at Jupiter and make some sketches of Jupiter and the moons. And that's a fun project if you're newbies, to look night after night and watch the dance of those moons. You can see the four Galilean satellites. Again, a once in a lifetime event. Next slide. When Comet Levy Shoemaker crashed into Jupiter. And uh, that view right there, that was with a 60 millimeter refracting telescope with a blue filter. And you could see the dark blotches there from where the comet, the piece of the comet crashed into Jupiter and left those it's almost like a soot patches or something. Again, a once in a lifetime event, and you didn't need a huge, you know, 
So 13 uh, or 14, uh, 14 inch telescope, you know, a small aperture instrument, 60 millimeter refractive. Is this a sketch? Sketches again, yeah. When you do a sketch, you put the south up. You know, I would have to go back. I think I put it. Let's see, I don't do anything with it, so it would be south up. The impacts were in the southern hemisphere. That's right. Yeah. Asking. yeah, okay, yeah. So that would be right. That would be south so up. You, in it. It's the inverted view. Sketch what you saw and didn't, yeah, didn't correct it. I didn't. I have lately for some of the ones I do for the club newsletter, but back then I just sketched as I saw them in the eyepiece. Okay. Very good point. Next slide. Saturn, and I discovered this with a three inch Edmund Titan. And this again is the excitement when you're using a telescope. Uh, I got back into astronomy. I, I used my uh, first time I was doing serious astronomy, I was in high school, 1963. My high, my high school friend Ray Gerby took me out in his backyard and he had that little 80 millimeter, 80, uh, 80 power Gilbert telescope. And we looked at Saturn. We looked at M13 and M31, which were just blobs, but he explained what I was looking at. That intrigued me. And then he showed me the middle star in the handle of the Big Dipper, Mizar. And that blew my mind more than Saturn, just to see two stars close like that. And that's, and I'm going to get into a little story here, I suppose. I don't want to take too much time. I could talk all night about this, but my friend Ray just passed away last spring. And the reason that I'm here, the reason I spent three years as president of the club, wrote for 20 years, everything, right up to the asteroid getting my name, thank you, Rich, was that one night, 1963, summer of 1963, I was a sophomore in high school, and Ray knew I was interested in astronomy, and he took me out in his backyard with that little Gilbert telescope and showed me those things. I was so fascinated, I borrowed that telescope, and that's when I looked at Jupiter, at Venus's phases. I used it to look at Jupiter's moons. I started looking at double stars, and then I ended up majoring in astronomy at UMass, where I met my wife, who I would have never met if I'd gone to some other track. So I've got two children, three grandchildren, my membership in this club, all, I don't know, I'd maybe be pumping gas someplace. I don't know what I'd be doing, but it wouldn't be astronomy. Ray took me out and just hooked me that one night, which is what I think about whenever we do a star party. But we hooked that one person, turned that into a lifetime of astronomy. And again, small telescope, would have got it going. If Ray had had a, Six millimeter, which back then was a big telescope, a six inch reflecting telescope on an equatorial model. I would have said, gee, this is neat, but I can't afford it. But he had that little jinky Gilbert telescope. And then I bought that Edmund scope I was talking about and the rest is history. Okay, anyway, back to this. I got back into astronomy in 1970. I was now in the army stationed at Fort Benning, Georgia. And I brought my little three inch down with me. And I started with Saturn. The first night I started keeping a notebook. And what I did was I sketched Saturn in three field stars. All I wanted to do was document its motion, a couple of nights of motion. I went out the next night, and there was something wrong with those three stars. They formed a triangle before, but now one had moved. You said it was in the right place. It had moved relative to the other two. I couldn't figure it was. I know Saturn had moved. It's supposed to. I went out the next night, and now, wait a minute, that star is moving with Saturn. Wait, that's, that's the moon Titan. I didn't think, like a lot of people would think, I didn't think you could see it with a small aperture telescope, but there it was with that three inch telescope and a magnification of about 60 power. Now, next slide. There are theoretically five Saturn moons that can be seen with a three inch telescope. Now, they're brighter than about 11th magnitude. And uh, the last time Saturn's rings were edged on, I was able to catch the, uh, the, the, the uh, moon Rhea, which is about a magnitude fainter. Titan is about 8.4. Rhea is almost a little bit brighter in tenth magnitude. I was able to see it with the, the three inch because Saturn's rings, with them being edged on, there was less glare. There are two other moons. For the, I don't, it's not the next slide. We'll back up again. Dion and Tethys, I think, are the names. They're about tenth magnitude, too, but they're only about a, a ring diameter or two ring diameters away from Saturn. Mm -hmm. So in the next two years, Saturn's rings are going to be edge on again. So I'm going to try for those. I know I'll have to use the highest power I can get with that little three inch scope, but I'm going to try to bag it with that little Edmund. There's another one. What's the one that changes brightness? Oh, I hate this. Uh, on one side of Saturn, it's about 10th magnitude, and the other it's 12th, because it has one really bright side, and that one faces us when it's on one side of Saturn. Anyway, that's a 10th magnitude object, and it's about 17 ring down, so that one should be picked up. So I'm still going to use, I'm still using that little 3-inch Edmund, I've had it for over 50 years now, 
And when next year I'm going to start looking for those other moons, so I can say that I've seen five of Saturn moons with a little three-inch telescope. Next, now the outer planets. This is approximately what Uranus would look like with that Edmund scientific scope at about 120 power. It's about four arc seconds across, so you will see a small bluish disk. These are my observations of Neptune. This is back in 1971, in the spring. It just happened, it was right near a double star, a Scorpii, and this is the field of view. It just looked like a star moving through the field, and that's going to lead me to asteroids as well. Uh, Neptune, I've never been able to see any kind of a disk. Theoretically, it's about two arc seconds, so you should be able to, and probably with that Questa, I bet you the Questa would give you the disk of Neptune on a really good night, as well as the disks of the Jovian satellites. But uh, with that, the little three inch, there are some limitations too, at least with the Edmund scope. It's only a, a one quarter wave, which is not what uh, we would like. Is that right? More like eight. That's eight exactly. Minimum. Yeah, so one quarter wave. I, I gotta tell you, when I was a major in astronomy, uh, the professor had us meet, he had to meet with all the freshman astronomy majors, and I had no idea what to talk about. So I said, I own a, I have a three inch Edmund telescope, and this girl looked at me and sniffed, that's only one quarter wave. Well, with all the adventures I've had with that three inch telescope over the years, I wrote an article about it in astronomy magazine about the things that I'm going to be talking about right now. But anyway, I like to look at asteroids, and at last count, with that three inch telescope, I've seen 121. I actually checked the count today, 121. The most recent one being just a couple of weeks ago was, I think it was the asteroid 268 Hermenti or something like that. It was about 11th magnitude, and I was able to pick it out in a couple of nights consecutive. But I, and this was kind of neat. Uh, it had an occultation with Kappa Gem. This is back in, uh, it's blocked out there, but I think it was in 1973 sometime. It was in the 1970s anyway, maybe late 1970s. 75, mid 1970s. But this was every 15 minutes. So that was kind of a neat thing to see. And it was supposed to blink out there, but it didn't. It was a near miss, and then it went beyond there. So typically, what I do for an asteroid is what I did for, for Neptune. I have a chart. Sometimes, you, by the way, you just look in the magazine, Astronomy and Sky and Telescope are always featuring really bright asteroids. I think Vesta right now, the brightest in the wall is near opposition. So find the chart and just look at it for yourself. And the way I do it, I'll just check the chart, then I'll check the field. And yeah, there's something there, there's no doubt about it, but I just like to be 100% sure. So I go out the next night to see if it's moved. If it's in the same place, I don't know what happened, but for some of the fainter asteroids, I wanna make sure I didn't see a field star by mistake. Especially when we get down to around 11th magnitude asteroids, there are a lot of 11th magnitude stars. So I usually try to do two nights in a row. And if I see a motion on that second night, then I'll write it down as confirmed. But that's what I, mean. I love to check out asteroids. There is a website called Bright Asteroids. It'll give you the brightest asteroids for the current month. And I check that first, and if it's one that I haven't seen, and by the way, if I go back to the 121 asteroids, I've seen all of the first 33 with that three inch Edmund telescope. Uh, 34 and 35 are weird. I don't know who discovered them, but they're on a magnitude fainter than most of the asteroids in that area. I don't know what the story was behind that. But then we go back to one that I've seen before, or the ones that are fairly bright during opposition. But anyway, I'll find out what asteroids are going to be visible in the next few months or a month or two. Then I'll go to the uh, Minor Planet Center, and they have an area you can get an ephemeris for the, the different positions for the asteroid for a certain number of nights. And then I go to the AVSO website where they have a variable star plotter and I plot charts. I plot the position, I make a handmade chart, uh, which is what I used to, to find Hermentia the other day. But they're fun to look at, they're not exciting, but it's just a neat game of, can I make my own charts? Can I find these things? For me, it's just kind of exciting. I started back in 1970 and I'm still going after all these years. And there's still, I pretty much cleaned out the really bright asteroids, but there's still a bunch that are around 11th magnitude that I like to check out. Next one, comets. Yeah, I know this didn't come out too clearly here, but um, this was comet Hayakataki. And uh, you know, one of the things I don't, of all the things I observe, I've never kept track of the comets I've seen. And I don't know why that is, except I think they will go from naked eye to certain size telescopes. And I like the consistency of that three inch telescope. So all the double stars I look at, I record them in my logbook if I've seen them with a three inch. The same with asteroids. And uh, you know, the same with deep sky objects. If I've seen it with a three inch, I'll record it in the log. If I don't, I don't put it in the comets. They're all different things. But what was neat with this one, this was observed with a four inch reflector, the, uh, uh, the sky quest. And you can see the bow shock. 
the Comet Hyatt the Taki, so, there is yeah. hope. Screens up there have a little better contrast than the projector. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, can you see it from up there? All right. Yeah. Anyway, again, comets are there. I've seen comets down to about maybe eighth and ninth magnitude. I haven't tried for the really faint ones. If I've seen a tenth magnitude galaxy, I should be able to see a tenth magnitude comet. But I, I kind of want to see a little like a tail maybe sprouting up. <laughs> comet Holmes, that had that really weird outburst a couple of years ago. Now, back back about what, what, 2008, I believe, or 2007. I did the whole sequence with that Edmund 3 inch telescope, the whole thing. I didn't need a big telescope. Agatak is actually naked eye. Oh, yeah. 60 degree field. Uh, <laughs> see, again, that's the thing. With an asteroid, it's mainly just how faint you can see with it. But with a comet, these things are so big, they're too big even for the 3 inch telescope. Just naked eye or maybe binoculars in some cases. But again, getting back to the main message, you can see these with the smallest of telescopes. You do not need the, because, and you know, some of you experts, by the way, maybe have these big telescopes. You might consider a small aperture telescope. Uh, I just remember, I'd, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'd seen all of the, uh, the Messier objects, and I gave a talk at Stellafane about that, and Tom Britton, you may, some of you remember Tom Britton, like one of the uh, old time members of the club, but he came and said, I don't believe you. He could not believe that you could see these things with a three inch telescope. It was just preposterous. So, if you have that attitude, forget about it. You know, you want you, a small aperture telescope is just nice to take if you're going on a trip and you just can't bring that big telescope along. Sometimes, Next, yeah. If you're going on a trip to a nice dark sky, a lot of times yeah. a small aperture will give you way better contrast than even a big one in the urban sky. Oh, yeah. There's a place for all telescopes. I think all of you should have at least one small rich field telescope. You know, the Edmund Astor scan is great as far as a nice wide field of view. Okay, we'll go on to the next slide. Uh, now we're going to go out to the sky, and you know, what's the faintest star you can see with a telescope? Well, I have a chart. We'll put that up now. These are, I don't know where I got this thing from. We'll go to the next slide. On eye, you can see the sixth magnitude. Uh, excuse me, on eye, the aperture in millimeters for an average one is about six millimeters, quarter of an inch. You can see down to 6.5. Again, if you're Stephen O'Meara, you can see down to 20th magnitude right. naked eye, but that's a different story. <laughs> Steve was a member of this club a number of years ago, wrote for Sky and Telescope, and the guy is just amazing, the eyesight he has, the things he can see. We're here, now, what are the two refractors they have? There's a 9 and a 15? Well, the 9 inch up on the roof. Is that the one we normally have access to? Yeah. I think yeah. We were with John Briggs, Steve O'Meara, and I were looking at Mars through that telescope. I saw our yellow-orange blob. I think, um, you know, but anyway, Steve gets up and he's naming all these features on Mars you can see. We couldn't see a thing. Now, of course, if you know Mars pretty well, you know what's supposed to be facing, but I think you honestly could see these things and we couldn't see a thing. And you saw those spokes in the, in the rings of, of uh, Saturn. Anyway, a Tasco refractor, 60 millimeters, can get down about 11th magnitude according to this chart. Again, it's where you were observing from. I'm assuming this is rural skies. If you're out way out in the, the outback someplace, you might go down to, as far as naked eye, down to you know, eighth magnitude. I think Steve uh, O'Meara has seen eighth magnitude stars from where he lived. Now, the three inch Edmund reflector, 11.5. The faintest I've gone to is about 12.1. So again, and how many stars can I see with a three inch telescope? Almost two million. Just with a small telescope like that, three inch. And like 4.5 inch Orion Dob, uh, gets down to about 12 and a half magnitude, four and a half million stars. That's of course the whole entire sky, north and south, but you get the idea. You can see a lot of stars. Next slide. Barnard Star. This is the star that has the greatest proper motion. And I did this with a three inch telescope. I started one night in 1976. And it was in the constellation Ophiuchus. In fact, that was a naked eye star. I forget now which star it was. But I made a sketch, showed there that little blue arrow, and it was moving in that same direction. And I just wanted to point out the two stars at the very top there. I call those the goalposts. Mm -hmm. And by that star was the football. And I knew it was going to go through those goalposts. Well, 10 years later, which was the next clear night in Massachusetts, <laughs> <laughs> I made another observation. There was definite motion. It was still going through those goalposts. So there is a documentation of the proper motion of the star with that little three inch Edmund Scientific uh, Telescope, the space conqueror. You know what, the little telescope did do a lot of space conquering for me over the years. <laughs> Next slide. Double stars. There's William Herschel, 
He thought that these were line of sight deals, and he wanted to show, to find the distance of the Earth, or some of these stars by parallax. The distance star is almost like fixed, and we'd see how much the star is, the, the foreground star, the brightest star is moving back and forth. Well, it turns out, it isn't the case. Some of these stars are actually side by side, one being brighter than the other, and that's the case with Castor. And Herschel finally discovered, maintained, or proved, that one star was orbiting the other. I think it was around 1802 he made that announcement that it was a gravitational system. Yeah. Anyway, in uh, 1976, I made my first sketch. That's the main pair right there. That third star up there is also part of the system. And each of these, by the way, is a spectroscopic binary. These are two pairs kind of doing like that. And this one's out there dancing around the three of them. So it's an amazing system. But back around 1976, Sky and Telescope wrote a thing. These stars at one point came so close together, you really couldn't split them with a typical backyard telescope. But they were saying how they're starting to open up. So I took a look with a three inch. I saw that I'd split them. I sent a little note to Sky and Telescope and they published it in the magazine. It was the first time my name ever appeared in the magazine. I gotta tell you, you can't believe how excited I was. Just see Glenn Chapel on the pages of Sky and Telescope magazine. So it was kind of a neat thing. First time ever for me. But here it was in 2008, you can see the motion, the companion has gone probably about, about almost uh, 90 degrees around the main star. This was near when they were close together. Uh, periastron is what they call it for binary star system. And it swung around right here, just a couple of years, it went zipping around and now it's come back out. This is probably the best double star to look at as far as bright components. I think the main one is about 1.5 or 1.9, the companions in the mid twos, I think. Those are two bright stars. It is the finest double star in the northern hemisphere. Alpha Centauri has the, uh, the claim in the southern hemisphere. But you're doing star parties. I mean, Castor is out right now this time of year. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a thing to chain, chain, you train your telescope on. That's a, it's really a, a mind boggling sight. Next, uh, before I get to Chapel's Ark, with my, with my Edmund scope, and I wrote the numbers down, and you have to bear with me, I want to get this accurate here. This is with double stars. I have seen, as of last night, double stars. I imaged that for you. Well, I'm not talking about the moon, Mario. So your double stars, 1,539. <laughs> the closest with two of them, there was Alpha Piscium and Zeta Aquaria, 1.8 arcsec. And Zeta is a twin system. They're both about fifth magnitude. And independent discoveries. What was that all about? Oh, there are so many double stars out there. I did do a survey. I wanted to see if I could discover double stars on my own. And I went by... Um, uh, FGW Struva, his, his thing was, if, if they're about 32 arc seconds or closer, I'm going to count that as a double star. If they're wider than that, I'm not, even though if there are double stars that are wider, like uh, Om uh, it's Omicron SETI there, we talked about a little bit earlier. But anyway, I just scanned some around the north, the north star in that area, plus 90 degrees, and I found about a half a dozen double stars that were not recorded by anybody. I made notes, I put their positions down, I sent a letter to Charles Worley, who at that time was the head of the double star division of the International Astronomical Union. I said, hey, I found these, do you want me to keep looking for more? And he said, stop looking, we got 65,000 already, we got too many to keep our hands on. So I kind of dropped it, and I think now they want really close binary systems. But there are double stars out there that haven't even been recorded or logged just yet that, are, that could be seen with a small three-inch telescope. Anyway, the story about Chapel Zach, I haven't talked about this much. But back in 1972, I was looking for a star called Herschel 1470. It was a double star in Cygnus. Now, it's a tough area because you're right in the Milky Way. And I started with Ada, Cygnus, and moved to a star called 25. And this star would be in the field of view. Well, when I looked with that three inch Edmund telescope, I thought the mirror had cracked because I saw four double stars. They all look the same, then really, but the angles aren't right, so the mirror didn't crack. There's four double stars in this little arc. And now that this thing is amazing, but back then I was just a novice, I'd just been getting astronomy, so I let it go. Well, then I started writing for uh, Deep Sky Monthly Magazine. And I, well, this is, I'm getting ahead of myself. Four years later, I had a better handle on how to estimate brightness, magnitudes, and position angle. And I finally figured out which one of those four was Herschel 1470. So I made a sketch in my notebook. I thought, this thing's kind of neat. 
I started writing for Deep Sky Monthly. I did a double star column. I thought, this thing we kind of need to share. So I wrote about it in the, uh, the magazine about these four neat double stars. Well, a guy named John Pasmino, some of you may be familiar with Pasmino's cluster. He lives out of Long Island. Apparently, he read my article and he wrote in his own club newsletter. He said, I looked at Chapel Zach. He's the one that dubbed it this. And he said, this thing is amazing. It's four double stars right in this nice little arc. And at that point, I figured, uh, well, I should tell Walter Scott Houston about this. This thing is actually, I guess, pretty neat. So I sent him a letter, and uh, he sent back the stuff like that all over the place. So I kind of mm. like, you know, you've been there, done. Yeah, I don't think he ever tried to look at it, which kind of ticks me off to this day, but I let it go. Okay, so there's lots of stuff like this, no big deal. Well, now I'm writing for Astronomy Magazine, and it's the year 2006, and I thought, you know, I don't want to use a magazine to promote myself, but this thing was kind of neat. Let me write about it. And I even put a tongue-in-cheek thing. I said, I want to have something in the sky named after me. And somebody said, yeah, it is. It's the Dumbbell Nebula. <laughs> 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 but then I wrote about Chapel's Rock in that column, in Astronomy Magazine, the world's largest published magazine. So a lot of people are reading about this. By the most amazing coincidence, I was also picking up in the newsstand the BBC magazine, Sky at Night. And I'm looking through the pages, and I see a chart. All I see is a chart, and there's Cygnus, there's Eden, and there's 25. And they're writing about something called the fairy ring. And as I look closer, it mentions a whole bunch of double stars. And oh my God, I just wrote an astronomy magazine about something named after me, and this thing has already been discovered. It's called the fairy ring. And I really felt stupid. So I don't know how I got a hold, but I contacted Sue French who'd also just written about this thing in Sky and Telescope, and she said she called it the fairy ring. She had no idea. She said, well, here are the guys that discovered it. It was Kim Hyatt, and I can't think of the other, Brent Watson, I think, from Utah. And they had found it back in around 1990, which was over 15, 20 years after I'd already found the thing. They had no idea what Chapel's Act was, because outside of Deep Sky Monthly, nobody knew what it was. And they had found it with a 10-inch telescope. And it actually added, but this is the actual arc right here. There's H1470. These are the double stars that I saw. Nice little arc. You see how bright they are. But with a 10-inch telescope, they complete this. It is called the fairy ring. Apparently, it's after some unusual formation of mushrooms where they'll actually form a ring around the main sprout that's in the middle. It's called the fairy ring. And that's where they get the name. So anyway, sure enough, uh, the stuff I, I called, and that's what I found out was Kim Hyatt. They'd found it in 1990, about 18 years after I'd seen it. So uh, what happened was there was a little news feed on cloudy nights. Does Chapel know this thing has already been discovered? So I wrote a follow-up article a year later explaining just what I said to you. Hey, I found it first, but you know what? What, what happens now anyway, it is on the list of asterisms on the Astronomical League's list, and it's called the Fairy Ring aka Chapel's Ark, and it's kind of neat. If you have a small telescope, you're going to see Chapel's Ark. If you have a big telescope, you're going to see the fairy ring. And how often do I look at Chapel's Ark? Rarely, because it's a bugger. I've got to get a finder chat out and you know, find my way to this particular in the sky, but it's a very neat object anyway. And just again, there's a four of the over 1,500 double stars I've seen with that little three inch. So I'm just kind of patting a three inch on the back. This was discovered with that little three inch telescope. Next slide. Oops. Okay. If it was me, we would have lost all the slides. <laughs> now let's get to variable stars. And this is a passion of mine now. It has been for since 19. I joined this club. The arrow star. What's that? The arrow star. <laughs> Cursor was on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It's it's one of the Starlink satellites. Get that thing out of there. Um, Arleus was my first variable star, and I started into an article in Sky and Telescope back in the 1970s, and I looked at it with a three-inch telescope. I made estimates, but I wasn't a member of the AVSO, so they're in my notebook from that particular time. I started to get really involved with variable stars with that little scope, and I started looking at them just for my own personal interest, until one time I just took all the observations I'd made of a star called S, <coughs> Ursa Minoris, it's a Myra type pulsating variable star, long period. And I made a graph, and to see that star's path drop like that and then come back up, that really hooked me. I gotta join the AAB, so, so I did in 1980, the same year I joined this club, so two milestones in the same year. The thing is, I jumped right to that 13 inch scope because I really wanted to see some faint cataclysmic variables, so I abandoned small telescopes. 
But the little telescopes, I still use them when it's, when it's appropriate. But with the Edmund scope, I would estimate it made about 1,000 variable star estimates before I got the big 13-inch scope. So definitely, stars down to about 11th magnitude, you can make a reasonably fair estimate of their brightness. You don't, when you start getting down the low, low 11, then it's kind of hard to see. It's hard to really make a reasonable estimate. But down to about at least 10th magnitude, and there are a lot of variable stars, that are brighter than 10th magnitude. Some of these, some of these variables are like this. This one goes from 6 to 10, roughly. 5 to 6 to 10. So you could see the whole cycle with a small aperture telescope. Uh, next one. I, that's the time. Uh, this is very testy because I gave a talk the astro at the Astronomical League Convention two summers ago about variable star observing, visual variable star observing. And one of the things I love is eclipsing variable stars. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a story. When I joined the AABSO in 1980, I picked up variable star observing like a duck to water. Don't ask me over it, I just got right into it. And uh, I became one of their top visual observers as far as numbers go. I remember John Bortle was one of the classics. It used to be that I, on a good year, I could get a minimum 3,000 observations, on a good year, 6,000. And Carolyn Hurlis, who was a protege of uh, Leslie Peltier, we were kind of pen pals, and she sent me a note one time, and she said she considered, he, he died in 1980, the same year I joined. And she wrote a letter, we'd been corresponding back and forth, and she knew about all the variable stars I was looking at, and she said she considered me his replacement in the AVSO, and I, that's heavy, that's heavy. <laughs> I knew I wasn't going to discover comets, but I figured I will set a goal. He made 130,000 observations in his lifetime. I'm going to hit that 130,000 mark, and that'll honor his memory. And I was well on my way. One of the big parts of it were these eclipsing variables, because I could go on a particular night, and you want to check out these stars maybe every 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, for a couple of hours. So you could get on one star anywhere from 40 to 40 more observations. Now, in between, I've got another telescope. I'm looking at cataclysmic variables. So long story short, in a good evening, I can make 80 to 100 visual estimates. Well on my way to 100,000. Well, then the CCD revolution came in. I remember John Wardle, this is back around 1990, telling me that would be the end of the visual observer. You know, uh, the poor person won't be able to do this anymore. It'll all be a rich man's game. But anyway, getting back to this, these are taken off the board now. I just talked about them a year and a half ago. Now I find out you're not supposed to look at them if you're a visual observer. Let the CCD people do this. And I was outraged. I understand. <laughs> If the amplitude is less than a magnitude, the visual observer is good to about three-tenths of a magnitude. And pardon me, I'm off topic a little bit, but it does, vary. It does kill all telescopes, small or big. Three-tenths of a magnitude. So I never tried a variable star that had an amplitude less than a magnitude, but two magnitudes? This one, I believe it's about, a, it's about a magnitude and a half. This is a neat one. And by the way, this light curve was made with an astro scan. And it's a really neat variable star. Um, RZ Cass, and uh, but anyway, they don't want them anymore. And I did send some very testy letters, and I got back. Well, we'll count them, but nobody's going to want to use them. I'm like, why the heck do I want to get out in the cold and make a bunch of observations that's nobody going to use? What I'm saying here is that my goal of reaching 100,000 ended because my bread and potatoes with the, with the eclipsing binaries also are our Lyra stars. You can get a lot of observations on one star in an evening. Sure. Those were taken off the board. And I'm still ticked because R.W. Torrey goes from 8 to 12 and a half. Why the hell do you need CCD observers when, and the thing is, the night that I made my observations of R.W. Torrey, I sent them into the AV, so nobody looked at that star in that particular time. So you know, what are the CCD people looking at? Are they going on maybe more like exoplanets? So I'm probably, I'm jumping around here a little bit, but I'm not going to get 100,000. Not if I can't do uh, eclipsing binaries. And I really feel bad, but I swear if Carolyn Hurlis, Leslie Peltier, Walter Scott Houston, if they were still alive, John Bortle is. Uh, John Bortle, I know, is pissed, but yeah. Just wondering if you've ever compared the accuracy of your visual observations with what the CCD people would do. I don't know what's going on now, but that's a good question, because when they first started putting, I said, what the hell are they looking at? I had it at like 11.8, and they had it at 10.7. They, they were at least a magnitude off and wondering, you know, what's going on? And John Bortle, I just emailed him recently about that. I'm he said the same thing. Infrared. What's that? I'm still 13 infrared. Yeah, but, but, but they weren't gelling at all. 
I've got no problem. Again, yeah, they should be they should be doing those small amplitude. But why the heck? If I can see a star that's four and a half magnitude, I get a nice light curve. Uh, I don't know. What to, I might still try. I did send again. The last message I got was do it. You can still count them, but nobody wants to look at them. I, I just can't see wasting that's my. That's why they made the standard that if you're going to image them on CCD, they use a yeah. filter, then it'll match your eyes. But I still think for something like this. In fact, Mara, you can tell me. What is too bright for CCD? If this goes from 6.4 to 7.8, can, uh, can that... You can always make a very short exposure. Okay. I mean, the, the naked eyes are, almost, are really hard to do. How about algal? Yeah. Naked too eye. Too bright. So there's, there's some variable status there. There's eclipses. I suppose I could do algal, I, but that's another story. But anyway, with a small, this was with a 4-inch astro scan. And with the three inch, I did look at RW Tory and it disappeared because it went down below 11th magnitude. It was really neat to see a star get fainter and fainter and then just disappear for a couple hours. And now oh, there it is, it's coming back up again. These are all just exciting adventures with a small aperture telescope. So again, you don't need you know, a 10 inch, 14 inch, 25 inch reflecting telescope. There's so many things you can see with a small aperture scope. Okay, let's continue. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so I'm a newbie to this, but with visual observations, how, how do you de determine the magnitude to that, that level of precision? Okay, I don't have, I, that would be my variable star chart, but I'll basically, the AABSO publishes charts that show the magnitude of stars in the field of view. So you take a look at your variable, and then you find something a little brighter and something a little fainter, and you just try to bracket. And you can usually get it within three-tenths of a magnitude visual observers. I, I would say sometimes the good ones can get even within one-tenth of a magnitude, one or two-tenths, but for the most part, three-tenths. So that's the about your visual. The chart would be sort of sort of like this, but with numbers annotating. Yeah, there would be numbers here. And I just showed, this is a uh, photographic view of a star called S.S. It's Cygni. It's a cataclysmic variable star. It's a white dwarf and a star like the sun. And the, the white dwarf accretes material from that star, it orbits around, then it becomes unstable, and there's a nova like outburst. It's basically what it is. So the occult is dwarf novae. In the case of S.S. Cygni, which some members of the club have been following, I know Joe Rothschild has been following this star, it's really neat. It'll have an outburst about every 50 nights, from 8th magnitude to 12th magnitude, rather, to 8th. And I've gone out of nights and there it is, a little 12th magnitude speck. I go up the next night, it's 8th magnitude. I've been caught on the way up. I've seen it go up about a half a magnitude in just a couple hours, so it's a great star. But anyway, these are observations, these are sketches made with my little three-inch Edmund scope. And this was back, I'm going to say about 1981, maybe 19, in the early days. And on one clear night, this is the field of view that you see up there, you can see the main stars, those two at the top. And there's a triangle, actually. These three stars are all about eighth and ninth magnitude. Those are the three stars you see there. And look at these three stars right here. This is a particularly clear night. Those are the three stars you see right up there. This middle one is 12.3 magnitude. And I was able to see it with that three inch average. Just a beautifully clear night. And I was able to see S.S. Sydney at its quiescent stage. It's around 12th magnitude at that time. Now, most nights I couldn't get below 11th magnitude. I'd send Jan and Maggie, I'd send in reports to the AVSO, and the thing is that star, when it's around 12th magnitude, it's not doing much, but when it hits 11th, that's when you start to keep an eye out because it goes into an outburst. Now I'm working with a 3 inch telescope, I didn't have the 13 inch at the time, I contacted Jan and Maggie, he said keep an eye on that, and if you see it go above 11th magnitude, I've got a phone number for you to call, it's an observatory over in Arizona that had a 60 inch telescope, and they wanted to catch as the signal as was going into an outburst. So I did that, and sure enough, one night I went out, my little three inch, I plunked it down. Oh, it's 11th magnitude, I called the observatory, they caught the outburst, and that again was made with a three inch telescope. Not, again, a 12 inch equatorial, but back then, 12 inch equatorial mounted telescopes were, the, were huge, those were monsters, and that little three inch was tiny. I wanna just go back to a story I should have told you at the beginning. My first telephone was 1973, and I brought the Edmund with me in the trunk of the car. As driving up the hill, I'm seeing what then were monster tell All six inch, eight inch equatorial mounted reflectors, the, the Dobsonian revolution hadn't happened yet. I was kind of embarrassed with this stupid little telescope in the back. So I just kept it in the trunk until it, it was darkness and then went out and started observing. Well, that was before I did the Messier catalog and all this stuff. 
It was two years later, I took that same telescope and I plunked it down in a tent with about 200 people and I gave a talk at Stellafane about what you can see with these little aperture telescopes. Kind of was the first time I gave a talk like I'm giving tonight. Anyway, so I did follow SS Sydney for a number of times and caught a number of outbursts with that little three inch telescope before I went to the 13. Next slide. I'm getting near the end, actually. Oh, we'll go past that slide. I meant to delete that when I forgot to. That's the same thing you saw earlier. All right, now we're going to go to deep sky. And I have seen the entire Messier catalog with that little three-inch telescope, everything. M1 right on to M110. The toughest, well, here was the first one. This was back uh, 1971, New Year's, New Year's Day or that night. Uh, 60 power with that little scope. And there's what I saw, based just an outline the trapezium right in there, and that's about it. Remember what I grew here, because I'm going to show you a later sketch. But that was, again, an unskilled eye. I was a beginner, and that's basically what I saw. This was, if I don't have the date, oh, yeah, there it is, March 27th. M91, that's the toughest one of the batch. It took me a couple of years before I had a night clear enough to see it with a three-inch telescope. It was just a bare glimmer. I added a couple of things. That particular net, I did a bunch of galaxies. Um, they were all in the Virgo area. And I mentioned it because this one is actually Herschel cataloged it because back then, this is one of Messier's middle, missing objects. M91 was not known. And it turns out he made a mistake in his reference star. And so in recent years, we've discovered that it is, in fact, a Messier object. Herschel, not knowing that, cataloged it himself. Now, here's a dean of visual astronomers at that particular time. And he categorized things by, at least with nebulas, by their brightness. If it was a what, class one object, it was a bright nebula. Class two, faint nebula. Class three, really faint nebula. This was a class two nebula. So here's an object that Herschel considered faint that I was able to pick up with that little three inch scope. And the same night I picked up NGC 4473 and I saw a little patch of light right there. I said, that might be NGC 4477, but I couldn't be sure. And I did just recently check a, a field of view of that. And that was, that's where the galaxy is. And it's a 12th magnitude galaxy. So maybe the magnitude estimate is off. I can't believe you can see a 12th magnitude galaxy, but I have seen galaxies down to about 11th magnitude with that little uh, Edmund Scientific Scope. By the way, just a disclaimer, that was back when I had six magnitude skies. I could see six magnitude naked eye. Now, a 10th magnitude, tele the 10th magnitude galaxy gives me a fit with a 10 inch reflecting telescope. It's gotten that bad. But this again, if you have fairly decent skies, uh, you can see a ton of things with a little aperture telescope. Okay, next slide. Uh, just a couple of things here. M35, with this little cluster right here, uh, Walter Scott Houston thought that was a comet. In fact, they sometimes they name, nickname it Houston's Comet. It's about an eighth magnitude star cluster, and I was able to pick it up with a three inch. Uh, it barely shows it's right in there, just a faint fuzzy patch. Next slide. Now here's the Orion Nebula the way I saw it more recently. A little bit more detail. In fact, you see the M23 as well there. Uh, the trapezium, very nice object right there. Uh, that's one of the things with, with imaging sometimes. When you try to get enough exposure, it clouds out any stars that are in there. But I know astro images can superimpose now, so you can get both the, uh, the, the trapezium, which is a multiple star, and the whole, the whole, uh, the whole uh, nebula itself. Next slide. Another one, and this one kind of surprised me, this is uh, M13, and here is a limitation to small aperture telescopes. You can't really resolve them, unless it's something like M22. I've resolved M13, this particular galaxy, I resolved it with an astro scan and really high power. You can see a graininess to it, but most of your globular clusters are going to be roundish patches of light. But there's a galaxy in there, and i got to stop and check just a second, because I don't think, yeah, there it is, right here. Right. And I don't think it shows on the sketch. Again, maybe contrast. Oh, that's it. That's it right there. Yeah. Uh, that's about 10 and a half magnitude. And that was it with a three inch telescope. What I did was I sketched the field carefully, drew where I saw that <laughs> it was an inverted vision. But then I went and looked at a wide field view, probably had a Burnham Celestial Handbook. And yeah, the galaxy is there. That's how I confirmed that particular one. Wow. Next slide. Oh, it won't happen now. But if you, have, if you happen to have one of those Edmund scientific scopes, you're going out to a dark sky area, have fun with it. You can, it's amazing the stuff you can see. Now, Andromeda Galaxy, this is again where you want a wide field. And this was made with an astro scan. Again, it's not, it probably shows better up there, but 
you get the expanse of it a couple of degrees. I couldn't see the, the parts right here of the, so but I saw the other two, the satellite galaxies, M30, what is it, M32 and M110. Right. And I'll just go back to the numbers for a second here. I want to give you a wrap up on this. We got two more slides to go. But I did do it, like, how many things I have seen with that three inch telescope. Let's see, deep sky. <clears throat> Following the sea objects, oh by the way, I didn't mention, M24 is a, is a star cloud, naked eye star cloud. But the, 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 uh, some of the, the uh, literature has it as NGC 6603, which is incorrect. NGC 6603 is a faint cluster in the middle of that. I would not count M24 until I saw that little cluster. And that's a faint bucket. Did I write down the magnitude? They say here 11th magnitude. And I remember struggling. That's what I would have to say is probably... Uh, the faintest one I've ever seen. Yeah, that's probably the faintest uh, deep sky object I ever saw was that 11th magnitude cluster. I did pick it out. And then M102 is not really officially a mess. That was a messy mistake, but they've got a galaxy in Draco now. It's a 10th magnitude galaxy, 10.7. And I wanted to see that one just to say, no doubt, I've seen every messy object plus the replacement they threw in for one that he didn't see. So anyway, with all deep sky objects, um, what have I seen? Deep sky. Nine diffuse nebulae, those are kind of relatively rare as far as bright ones. 69 galaxies, <coughs> this is with a three inch Edmund scope now. 45 globular clusters, 72 open clusters, and 15 planetary nebulae. Uh, the faintest star I've ever seen was 12.3 in that SS Cygni field. Okay, now we're just wrapping things up here. Next slide. I saw an extra galactic supernova with a small aperture telescope. I forget the distance of this galaxy, NGC 3877. I know it'll be several dozen million light years away. Uh, the, the, the supernova itself went up to about 13th magnitude, and I saw it with an astro scan. And this is my sketch right here. And it was right near X Ursa Minoris, or my Ursa Majoris. Very easy to find this thing. And I saw this little patch, and just a very faint, foggy mist nearby. I made a note. <clears throat> Supernova also seen with three inch, but no hint of galaxy. Well, the galaxy is 12th magnitude. So it's something to catch with an astro scan to begin with. And this was not as long ago as some of these other ones, 1998. I was already getting light pollution coming in the area there. But I was still able to see a supernova tens of millions light years away with a small aperture telescope. And, yeah. 290 million light years. What? 290. 290 million? Oh, you see? Wow. Well, look at how pixelated it is. Holy cow, that's actually the Hubble image right there. I didn't know they'd come out like that, but that was kind of a blow up of this particular thing. Well, let's go to the final slide. How far can you see with a telescope? You can see 2.4 billion light years. And it's the quasar 3C273. And I saw, this is with an astro scan. And this is an image right here. And I don't know if I can relate the stars. You see the stars there? There's one, two, three, four. It's almost, if I remember right, it was like a cross. And there it is right there. And there it is. It was just a flicker of light in the astro scan. That's 13th magnitude. But I definitely, it was, it was observed, averted vision. And what I do there is I see a flicker of light. Okay, I'm seeing things. I want to see that flicker of light a couple of times. Then I know it's not, a, it's not an not effect in my eye. There's something there. And that's how I saw it. It was very fleeting, but I was able to pick it out. So quasar, the, what's, if they say it's the most distant object visible, the common backyard telescope. I think there are some that are out there, but this is definitely the faintest one you'll see. Yep. Anyway, that's my voyage from the, block your ears, Mario, from the moon <laughs> to quasars with a, the small aperture telescopes. And uh, like I say, what's happening to me, I just downsized. I went from that. 13 inch scope to a 10 inch scope. It's just getting a little harder to maneuver. And when I'm doing star parties, I just hate to load the 10 inch into the telescope. I'd rather take a, that little four and a half inch with one hand, put it in the back, and just invite people to take pictures of their cell phone. Uh, at this point, I'm glad, I appreciate you showing up. I hope I taught you a few things, but do you have any questions or did I cover everything thoroughly? That was fun. <laughs> I had fun, but I don't know if the audience does sometimes. I, I'm going to put this on. We have it on the internet. I, if I can't sleep, I'll just put it on. I'll probably fall asleep <laughs> in my own talk. Seriously, I've done that. I, there was a tape in one of my talks. I sat there to watch, and I was like this. Yes, yeah, Steve. 
Don't forget the time you were you got, did the Messier list at the clubhouse, and you got a hundred objects in one night. Ninety-nine. I didn't. That's like that's like batting two ninety. I just didn't get that hundred. <laughs> and what I did, the, the morning sky is was M thirty, and what there's a couple there, and I was looking for them. I had forgotten about M fifteen. And when I really stupid idiot, I went and I couldn't find it. If I remembered, I would have gotten one hundred. I stopped at ninety-nine. So very good. Hell yeah. Yes, Sal. So. Uh, my first scope was the Gilbert scope, and I was probably 10 or 11, and, you know, yeah, and what's very interesting is where I observe right now is the same physical spot where uh -huh. I used that telescope for the first time. Yeah, that's so kind of neat. There's the Gilbert scope, and then my second scope was the Edmund Super Space Conqueror. It was 29.95. Yeah. I remember, and I buy it used for fifteen dollars, and uh, I couldn't stop using the thing. And you know, the objects that burnt a hole in my head were in the beginning were the moon, Jupiter, and Saturn, and those are my, still my three favorite objects. Um, <laughs> he said out of three, so it's only one third bad. <laughs> yeah. So, That's so fun. the bottom line is uh, same same scopes. And uh, I don't, I don't have those scopes anymore. And uh, now I'm using a six-inch scope, which is kind of all I can handle right now. Now you miss those scopes you used to own, right? They had a profound effect on me. The collectors, I've got two of them. That Edmund that I bought for fifteen. That could probably go for about fifteen hundred now. I think it's a rare collector's item. It's an I, antique. I gave them away to somebody in the yeah. family, and I don't even remember. Who. So anyway. Yes. Uh, one of my really remarkable documentation you've done over the years, you get to enjoy again what your observations were. <laughs> Reliving it, yeah. Now, what would your estimate be of how many pages in your logs you accumulated over the years? That's a very good question because Rich and I were talking. It's a morbid thought, but we're getting up there in years, and what do we do with all this stuff? I'm going to bequeath a lot of my astronomy equipment to the club, unless anybody in the family wants it, but I don't see anybody. But yeah, I've got, I kept an annual book from 1971, and I was pretty religious up until the mid-1980s, and now I've still got a scattering. I've got to put them together. But yeah, for 50 years, I've got notes from, again, the, the thing, that sketch you saw of, of uh, the, the first Messier thing. That was the first night I went. It was October 15th of 1971. That was the first. I'm still making sketches to this date. The problem I was thinking and you know, again, I don't want to make it sound like I'm, you know, it's almost like I'm applying some type of godliness, and that's not the term I'm thinking of, but I was going to bequeath them to the club, and that sounds kind of arrogant in a way. I think some people would love to see this stuff. I'd love to get my hands on stuff that Walter Scott Houston had had, notes he took over the years. And I've got manuscripts of articles I wrote. I don't know if it'd be interested in anybody, but I'm just going to say throw this stuff out. But if anybody was interested, the problem is because they're on pencil and paper, They've kind of faded over the years, but I've got sketches. Everything that I talked about, there's sketches of them in that notebook. You need a presidential library. <laughs> <laughs> Again, my wife, my wife says she's going to get a dumpster and just toss the stuff. I've got books that were, I've got Clyde Tombo's autograph uh, back, it was worth more when he discovered when Pluto was still a planet, but it's still a, a little, it was a 10 cent book, one of these things that they, they sell in the junior high school. And I bought it, and I sent it to him. He autographed it, wrote me a nice little letter. It's in that book. My wife's going to see that in the trash can. And I'm sure there are people who pay maybe 20 30, I don't know. They, they pay some money to get that particular thing. So I'll have to uh, definitely itemize some of this stuff. Yes. Okay, I was going to say, a great talk, by the way. Um, I've, I've fallen back in love with small refractors. Oh, yeah. Um, and so I've got like the a bunch of the old Tasco. Royal Astro Optics refractors, and my, the sweet spot, I swear, is the 76.2 millimeters, mm. three-inch refractor. Oh, uh, yeah. Be a Unitron or a Royal Astro. And while you can't go, it, it, it's not like you're using the club's 25-inch telescope, but what you can actually see through those telescopes is really quite amazing. And, oh, yeah. Um, looking at the moon, planets, double stars, uh, some of the brighter deep sky objects, and what I was going to say, if, you're, if your talk is intrigued other members, 
a great place to find some of these vintage telescopes is Facebook Marketplace. Mm. Because people are finding them in their, you know, dad's garage and Uncle, oh, yeah. at, at Uncle Tom's basement, and they don't know what's quite to do with these telescopes. So they're actually relatively inexpensive. You might have, like we had to clean the objective of your, your telescope, right? You may have to dust it off a little bit, but you can really buy these things for between fifty and hundred bucks usually. What do you say those scopes are worth? Well, that's a, it, it. All depends on who you can find to buy them from you, but I, I typically pay fifty to hundred dollars for a. Like a 2.4 inch vintage Tasco from the 60s. Okay. And, and don't poop out Tasco telescopes from the 60s. Not though, they, no, they're they classics. Top notch optical. Royal Astro Optics made some fine optics. Yeah. And they're just wonderful telescopes. Um, I keep telling Glenn and I keep talking about having a club uh, member event, uh, having a small scope star party at the clubhouse where, you know, or less than, you know, only bring less than a six inch telescope. And you know we can provide a list of possible objects to look at and um, have at it. You know I think that'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> By the way, that was my first talk. My next talk is about fishing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got this from Phil. Don't, don't get Glenn started with fishing. Oh, it'd be worse. <laughs> but just a quick, these things float over. They're like little boats. Your leg goes in the water, and you put on a pair of waders and swim fins. You can paddle around the pond, and the thing is, you're so low to the water, the fish can't say, oh, God, I love this thing. I've been, you get to see nature as a real, like a snapping turtle going under your boat, like, holy gee, I'm going to lose a foot. But anyway. And you can bring binoculars, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, any other questions? I've, been, I've had fun. I hope you had, too. And as I always say, keep looking up. But again, for you newbies, you don't have to go out and buy that eight inch of eight inch Celestron was a big deal. I think a lot of people bought that as their very first telescope. Your first telescope should be after your naked eyes, a pair of binoculars, and then get a telescope once you know what's going on. But uh, that four inch sky course is a nice scope. I tend to think nowadays the ideal first telescope is a six inch F8 reflector because you can cover a lot of areas with that. In the day, a 6-inch telescope was considered medium aperture, that and the 8-inch. When you get to 10 and 12, you're now talking about big scopes. Now, I didn't mention it, but the 6-inch is probably at the top of that small scope thing. But again, if you take a 6-inch reflector and then a 6-inch refractor, technically they both have the same capabilities, but a 6-inch refractor is not a small telescope. Maybe you go by weight in that case. That's a huge telescope. Yeah, that's a lot more, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, multiple times more. Uh, but I would say a six inch F8 for a beginner is probably the way to go. And even no frill, just get the, you know, sometimes they have the go to telescopes. I find sometimes the batteries go or things go haywire and it's just that bare, bare, uh, bare bones uh, Dobsonian telescope. It's back and forth, up and down, finder scope. I don't even like the red dot because sometimes the battery goes out or I forget to shut it off. Just a regular straight through finder and I'm good to go. Okay, any other questions? How many want me to talk about fishing? <laughs> well, you have Because that's been the January. Then nobody, well, whoever has the snacks, if I give a talk on fishing in January, no one's going to come. So. Have to be ice fishing now. <laughs> yeah, uh, if I get out, this global warming, folks. Uh, I remember being able to go ice fishing this time of year all the time. Now, last winter, in fact, January 7th, there still wasn't enough ice on the pond where I fished. I was furious, but it was a nice mild day. So I took my float tube, I have another one like this, and I paddled out in that pond. There was ice on one of the bays. I was still catching fish in mid-January. Science, wooden lures pop to the top, metal lures go to the bottom, and you have to reel really slowly <laughs> in the winter so it doesn't work. But now they've got neutral density, neutral buoyancy plastic lure. They sit there. So I use one of those, cast it out, twitch, 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 and then sit. And then bam, a fish see, oh, it is an easy meal, and they grab it. So again, thanks to science and technology, you can catch fish anytime now. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, Chris, did you shut off the tape before I gave that fishing talk? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and the fire department will come and save you. So with that, we'll uh, officially close the meeting. And our next meeting will be January 11th, 8 p.m. I want to thank Glenn for the incredible talk and thank Eileen for providing the refreshments in the back. Okay.